Let's go to our, our reading as we prepare to hear God's word and uh, unfold it in due course. Philippians 3, verses, well, read 10 to 16, focus perhaps on 12 to 16, but including verses 10 and 11 too. Uh, so starting at verse 10, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Amen. What is it that makes great athletes train hard? Simple question, simple answer, really. What is it that makes them train hard? It's the prize. The prize makes them train hard. The thought of winning the prize at the end of the race. That's what makes them get up early in the morning. That's what makes them stretch and strain and train hard. All the rest of it, working out. Because they want to win the prize. It was just the same in Paul's day. In Paul's day, the winner of a race was summoned from the stadium to the seat of the judge. The wreath of leaves was placed on his head, a crown of leaves. In the city of Athens, in Greece, the winner was also awarded 500 coins, free meals, and a front row seat at the theater. That was the prize they were running and training for and straining towards. What makes you work hard towards something or for your exams or some other test or qualification? Well, it's the thought, above all, of what it will get you, of the prize the grades, the qualifications, and then hopefully the job opportunities. So you work hard. And what was it that made Paul, the writer of these words, work hard at his Christian life? Well, of course, it was the thought of the prize at the end of his life. Verse 14, I press on towards the goal to win the prize. But what was the prize? What was the prize for which God had called him heavenwards in Christ Jesus? Verse 14. Well, you could say the prize is heaven. He's been called heavenwards. More literally, it's upwards, heavenwards. We can say more than that as we look at other verses around verse 14. What was the goal and the prize? Well, you could say it's resurrection. Go back to verse 11. Paul wants somehow, miraculously, wonderfully to attain to the resurrection from the dead. He's looking forward to a resurrection. That's a prize at the end of the road. You, can, you could say that again in verse 21. We'll come to that next week, but he's looking forward here, here in verse 21, isn't it? To the day when, or the time when Jesus Christ will transform his lowly body so that they will be like his glorious body in resurrection glory. So you could say the prize is resurrection. 
And you can say it's Jesus himself who's the prize. Because more than anything, Paul wants to know Jesus, verse 10, as Andy brought to us last week. And he wants to know and experience the fullness of everything that Jesus has lived and died and risen again to bring to his people. And he says, doesn't he, in verse 8, that it's the best thing ever to know Jesus. So he wants to know him in all the fullness of glory. You can say that it's resurrection. You can say that it's Jesus. You can say that it's being with Jesus and being like Jesus. Because verse 10 refers to becoming like him. And again, verse 21 talks about being transformed like his glorious body. And Paul is looking forward to all of these things. And if we went through the whole of the scriptures, we'd find all kinds of ways that the Bible describes this, this prize. The crown of righteousness, the crown of life, the crown of glory, the crown that never fades away. All pictures, picture language about this prize that lies ahead of Paul and all believers. The New International Reader's Version simply translates the end of verse 14 this way, the heavenly prize is Christ Jesus himself. A full knowledge of Jesus, a full experience of his grace and love in the resurrection. One writer calls it the full and complete gaining of Christ for whose sake everything else has been lost. The Christian hymn, Fight the Good Fight, which we'll hear later on at the end of the service, puts it like this. Run the straight race through God's good grace. Lift up your eyes and seek his face. Life with its way before you lies. Christ is the path and Christ the prize. For Paul, this prize of Christ and resurrection and glory was so good, he was prepared to give up anything for it. And he was giving everything he had to reach that goal and win that prize. And unless you and I can see how good this prize is, how wonderful, how exciting, how mouth-watering, how satisfying it will be, we will never put in the effort that Paul put in. We have to appreciate, we have to see, don't we, that this prize is the best prize ever. So then how does Paul go about pressing on towards this goal to win this prize? He tells us clearly in these verses. First, refuse to be complacent. Do not think you have already arrived. Paul says this about himself twice in verses 12 and 13. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, verse 12. Verse 13, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. That prize. And if you say something twice, well, it's probably important, isn't it? Very important. Paul refuses to become complacent in his Christian life. He knows he is far from perfect, and he must press on. If you're, if you're perfect, you don't need to make progress. But he's far from perfect. Now, often when someone says, I know I'm not perfect, but they mean it as an excuse. They mean, so I'm not perfect, but I'm okay, I'm all right, I'm doing my best. Well, this is not at all what Paul means when he says, I'm not perfect. It is something that makes him want to go further and higher and deeper with all the energy God has given him to press on, to progress, not to stay where he is, not to be complacent, not to sit back and say, oh, I'm saved. Now, I can take it easy. 
We will never press on if we think we have somehow, in some way, already arrived. Or we think we're okay as we are. So that's the first thing, I think, that Paul does as he presses on toward the goal to win this magnificent, this glorious prize. There's two more ways that Paul pressed on toward the goal. They're in verse 13. Look at the middle of verse 13. One thing I do. One thing. Paul is focused. This is focus, isn't it? One thing I do. And I don't know about you, but, well, I probably do. We do struggle with that, don't we? We struggle with focus, with concentration. It's that moment, isn't it, when you're in the zone. When you're really getting down to something. And you're really getting into something. And nothing else is distracting you. And I must admit, I really struggled this week and yesterday afternoon with getting down to this and getting into this message today. And I prayed the Lord would give me focus. But so often our attention is diverted and distracted. Our forces, our energies are scattered by multiple things, multiple concerns, multiple screens. Perhaps, and the Bible talks to us about single-mindedness. This one thing I do. The ability to give our full concentration to one thing. That's when the best work gets done, isn't it? Someone has called it deep work. And sometimes in just an hour of deep work, of concentrated effort, we can get so much more done and over a whole day of just, you know, lolling around. The ability to give our full concentration to one thing is a wonderful gift. Microsoft Word, if you use that, has a relatively new feature. And the feature is called Focus. And if you click on, the, on it uh, at the bottom of your screen, all you can see is your screen. Everything else is blacked out. The document you're working on is all you can see. You can't see anything at the bottom of the screen or to the sides. And it's meant to help with focus, with the one thing you're meant to be doing at that time. Paul wrote, one thing I do. Forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize. Now as we read these words... At first glance, we might think there's more than one thing. It sounds like two things, or even three things. Look at it again. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on. Is that two or three, or is it just one? Well, the good news is that really it is one. But he's going to do it in two ways. There are two parts to that one thing. He is pressing on toward the goal. That is the one thing. And he's going to do it by firstly forgetting what is behind and secondly by straining towards what is ahead. Those are the two parts to this one thing. The one thing is pressing on. The two parts are forgetting what is behind and pressing on to what is ahead. So there's an attitude toward the past and an attitude toward the future if you're going to press on toward the goal. As we look back to the past and as we look forward to the future, what effect does it have upon us? Does it hold us back or does it push us forward? Well, let's look at both of those now. And this is really the heart of the message today. First of all, forgetting what is behind. What does that mean? Forgetting what is behind. You can't press on in the Christian life unless in this sense you forget what is behind. Now, does it mean that the Christian should forget everything in their past? Should you, have, should you throw all your memories out the window? Well, no, of course not. It's not that. 
Paul himself remembered many things. We can see that from this letter and from all his letters. He remembered his friends in Philippi, obviously. Chapter 1, verse 3, I thank my God every time I remember you. And deliberately and frequently Paul remembered, he called them to mind, their, their names, their faces, their needs, and he prayed for them. And so should we. Paul also remembered his past life, the life that Christ had saved him from. And sometimes he deliberately called that to mind in such a way as to remember and appreciate all that Christ had done for him. And so should we. Notice that he always did that in the light of the gospel. When you look back to your former life, before you came to Christ, remember to turn on the gospel light. Otherwise it could be very depressing. Uh, Warren Wearsby very helpfully writes in his little book on Philippians, that we cannot change the past, but we can change the meaning of the past. There were things in Paul's past that could have been weights to hold him back. He's referring here to some words of Paul in 1 Timothy 1, 12 to 17. But instead of being weights that held him back, there were inspirations to speed him forward. The events did not change, but his understanding of them changed. And I'd like to say, he turned on the gospel light. He saw his past in the light of the gospel. Paul, you see, clearly remembered how Jesus had taken hold of him, verse 12 of Philippians 3. And he thought back at times to his conversion to Christ on the road to Damascus. So we're not to forget those things. We're also told to remember those who spoke the word of God to us. Hebrews 13, who taught us the Bible. Like Timothy, whose mother and grandmother taught him the Bible. He was to remember that. He was to think of that and their way of life, their godliness. It's good for us to think of those things. It's good for us to remember those things. Of course, regularly we are called to remember Jesus at the heart of everything we do in our times of communion. That's a call, isn't it? To remember Jesus. Do this in remembrance of me. So we're not to forget that. And in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, in the letter to the church at Ephesus, if our love is growing cold, our devotion to Christ is faltering. What are we told to do? We are told to remember the love we had for him at first. When you first came to Christ, remember that love. And let your memory rekindle your love for him. So there are definite things for us to remember, to think about, and even to dwell on, as long as we remember to do it in the light of the gospel. But there are also things to forget. To deliberately work at forgetting, to put behind us. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that we can somehow wipe our memories clean as if we were a computer but to put things behind us that are done with and settled. There are things in particular that we must not dwell on, or certainly, certainly not consider outside the light of the gospel. If we want to press on towards the goal, they will hold us back. Like what? What things are we to forget? What are we to put behind us? Well, living too much in the past, which is easier and easier as you get older and older, because there's a lot of past behind us, isn't there? The good old days, we call them. Nostalgia, we call them. 
Ecclesiastes 7 verse 10 has this wisdom. Do not say, why were the old days better than these? For it is not wise to ask such questions. Now, of course, it can be nice, it can be lovely to take a little time to uh, take a trip down memory lane, look at some old photographs, and so on. But if we start dwelling too much on the past, getting stuck in the past, so that you begin to feel sad in the present, so that the present feels like a big disappointment, because those were the good old days. Well, that's going to hold you back, and you're never going to press on. What else are we to forget? Well, the gospel frees us to forget or put behind us the bad things we've done. The gospel of Jesus can set us free from the past. And all the sin and all the mess we've created and caused. Because through Jesus, all our sins can be forgiven and forgotten. Remember what God himself says to his people. I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. They are forgiven and forgotten. This means he will not bring them up again. He will not hold them against us. They are entirely forgiven and forgotten, born by Christ on the cross, and now right out of his mind and right out of his record book. And of course, Paul himself had made some very bad mistakes in his past. Mistakes isn't the word for it. He had even persecuted Christians to the death. But he was confident that even these sins, these heinous sins, were forgiven through Christ on the cross. Entirely forgiven and forgotten. Remembered no more. And he could put them all behind him. And escape his sinful past. And press on towards the beautiful future ahead. God's full and free forgiveness, as one Christian writer has put it, resolves the past and clears a path for the future. And not only can you put behind you the bad things you've done, you can put behind you the bad things that have been done to you. Because the gospel not only provides forgiveness for all our bad things, it provides the power for us to forgive others the bad things they've done to us, which may haunt us. Those who are forgiven are able, in turn, to forgive. Luke 11, verse 4, Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. The Bible is clear. Forgiving, genuine forgiving, means always forgetting, putting it all behind you, no longer holding it against someone, never bringing it up again. We are to forget those bad things in all the grace of God. And what else are we to forget if we press on, if we are to press on towards the goal to win the prize? Well, even the successes of the past the achievements, the accomplishments, while we thank God for them as we recognize the grace of God in them, we must not dwell on them in a way that makes us live in the past or rest on our laurels, our accomplishments, or become complacent and sit back as if we've already arrived. And Paul could certainly have done that as well, couldn't he? So he is determined to forget what is behind. Kent Hughes, in his excellent book on, on uh, Philippians, Colossians and Philemon, uh, speaks about this forgetting what lies behind as a special kind of forgetfulness. The kind that, that does not turn and glance back from the goal to indulge in the complacency of past achievements. He says that would have been easy for Paul to do if he had given way to it. He had been the man, the heroic apostle, 
amidst beatings and betrayals and shipwrecks and danger upon danger. His epic life was truly without parallel. He was and remains the theologian of the church. More, he was the missionary to the Gentiles, the missionary general of the early church. The apostle Paul could boast of a trailing ring of established churches shining as lights across the darkness of Asia and Europe. But Paul chose not to look back on his accomplishments, lest they diminish his focus or lull him into complacency or indifference. His successes, his failures, were not going to turn his head in that way. He was not going to dwell on them. He was not going to live in the past, either his sinful past or his successful past. And so, Paul Rahn says, Hughes, in the liberating freedom of his one thing, he was flying in his forgetfulness. Look straight ahead, focus, he says. So Paul is pressing on, refusing to be complacent, or to think that now he's saved, he's fine, he can, he can sit back, he can take his retirement. He can let go and let God. Perhaps you've heard that expression. Perhaps you've used that expression, let go and let God. Quite a popular expression amongst Christians. And if it simply means take time to find rest in God, well, that's fine and good. But if it means you don't have to try, you don't have to struggle, you don't have to make an effort as a Christian, then it's seriously wrong and unhelpful to say, let go and let God. Because, just look at the next words in verse 13. Forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. Straining or stretching or reaching towards that goal and that prize in Christ Jesus. Uh, and you can't miss, can you, the passion of Paul here, the determination, the drive, the energy, the effort he's going to expend to reach this goal with all the energy God has given him. Chapter 2, verse 13. All the energy God was working in him. This is a picture of intense, concentrated effort, like the image on the screen. Now, for sure, the energy comes from God. Chapter 2, verse 13. But we must use it. We must apply it to strain, to stretch, to reach towards the goal for which God has called us heavenwards in Christ Jesus to that prize which is so good, so glorious, so perfect. And so whilst there are things to remember, and particularly to remember and even to dwell upon in the light of the gospel, the Christian life is mostly a life not of looking back, but of looking forward, looking ahead. Christians are hopers, not stuck in the past. The best is yet to come. I've compared the Christian life before to driving a car or even riding a bike, to some extent, even walking in a straight line along the road. But let's stick to driving a car. I think it's a good comparison. When you're driving a car, sometimes you have to look back. I mean, you have to look in the, the rear view mirror or the side mirror so you can see what's behind you. But if you do this too much, you'll be sorry. Most of the time, we want to look forward, don't we? We want to look at the road ahead and towards the destination. Too many backward looks, or for too long, in driving, or running, or cycling, or even walking, can hold you back, or slow you down, or take you right off course. So keep looking ahead, most of all. Paul is pressing on by first forgetting what is behind, and now straining towards what is ahead, like this 100-meter runner. 
And so as we come to the final two verses about uh, uh, in the passage this morning, we can see that Paul calls this a mature view of things. And in fact, in the second half of that verse, verse 15, we see that this is really God's view of things. Because if we see things differently, God will make it clear to us. It's not just Paul's view of things, this is God's view of things. This is the true way, the right way, the perfect way to see things, to live, to make progress as a Christian towards the goal to win that heavenly prize. And so if you're feeling complacent, if you're taking it easy, if you're being laid back in your Christianity, a bit sleepy, you are taking an immature view of things, according to Paul. And he calls you, with all the affection in his heart, to snap out of it, and to snap into this. Wake up, he says, for this is the only way to live the Christian life. Full speed ahead, full throttle, no holding back. Verse 16, only let us live up to what we have already attained. Let's go forward together. The normal Christian life is to put off anything that holds you back and reach with all your might toward the goal to win the prize with focus and discipline and determination as you use all the energy God has given you. All the energy God is working in you by his Spirit. Because the prize, you see, is altogether worth it. It is altogether worth it. We need a vision of that prize, don't we? It is the ultimate prize. It is the heavenly prize. It is the prize that never fades away. The crown of life, the crown of righteousness, the crown of glory. And the crown that never fades away. It will last forever. A Wimbledon tennis champion was once asked how she felt about defeating some of the great players of her time. She responded, any big win means that all the suffering, practicing and traveling are worth it. I feel like I own the world. But when she was asked how long that feeling lasts, she replied, about two minutes. But here is a win and a prize before us now that will not last for two minutes, but forever. As Paul says in another of his letters, 1 Corinthians 9, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown, a prize that will last forever. So he also wrote, run in such a way as to get the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. So with Paul, let's encourage one another to press on toward that goal, to win the prize for which God has called us heavenwards in Christ Jesus. And finally, just finally, Think of the one thing that you are most devoted to in your life. The one thing that you uh, perhaps spend many hours on every week. Think of that one thing. Could be a TV program, could be television itself, it could be sport, whatever it is. There's, there's probably something that you spend more time on and give more attention to and more devotion than anything else. Well, just imagine, what if you swapped that for this? You swapped that for this. If you put all those hours, all that energy, all that attention, all that devotion, sometimes I think about my, my youth, I think of this. What if, what if, what if I put all of that energy that I put into sport, for example, 
and flip things. I'm not saying I wouldn't have done sport. I'm sure I would have. But all of that time I spent. What if you put it all into this race? All into this pursuit? What spiritual strength, what confidence, what satisfaction, what hope, what joy and peace could be yours if you put all of that into this and made this your one magnificent obsession? Pressing on to, to win the prize, toward the goal to win the prize. Could be ours, imagine. Let's pray. Father, please would you give us the grace and wisdom to make this the great obsession of our lives. The, the one thing we want more intensely than any other and to press on with all the might you've given us, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead for that unbelievable prize that lies at the end of the race. Please give us the wisdom to reach and stretch and strain for that prize. In Jesus' name. Amen.